Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project Magnetic Reversal News and Shinrin Yoku bringing you a grand solar minimum update Monday, November 9th, 10 p.m. Mountain Time 2020. The models are in and they are not funny. Check out Washington State and the increase in snow as we move through November in Idaho. We're buried out west, but the big story, Tropical Storm Ada. Florida braces for impact after dozens die in Central America. Yes, low-lying areas of the Florida Keys have been evacuated after dozens were killed in Central America. Guatemala and Honduras. Keep calm. It's boom time. Tropical Storm Ada causes dangerous flooding in Florida, far worse than they could have imagined. And there, we do have some pictures here. The system-wide reach to heavy rains posed a serious threat across southern Florida, an area already drenched with more than 14 inches of rain over the last month. Ada could dump an additional 6 to 12 inches over the coming hours. It's far worse than we could have imagined. And we're prepared, said R.B. Walker, a 27-year-old student who had to slosh through water covering his apartment's floors in Fort Lauderdale. Well, apparently you weren't prepared because you live there. <laughs> it's been pretty much nonstop rain since yesterday. There's five to six inches of rain in our apartment right now. You can see here one of the pictures of many of the, there's an apartment complex completely flooded, cars partially underwater. This is Lauder Hill, fire units on the scene rescuing someone from a vehicle. Now why they took him from the shallow water into the deep water is anyone's guess. But that's how they do it. There is good news in Central America today. A small child was rescued from a flooded village. That's a boom. I love it when a plan comes together. Now, according to NOAA, Tropical Storm Ada tracks to Florida, and here are the spaghetti models. Ada is now sitting in a two-package low here off the uh, western shore of Cuba, just to the north. It's going to sit there for days. In fact, all the way to the weekend. It's expected that Tuesday it will linger off the shore here. Wednesday it will just move slightly north, and Thursday it will be off the western shore of, let's say, what, what's right over here? Sarasota, <laughs> maybe? And Friday at 1 p.m., it's still over the eastern shore of central Florida, where it's supposedly, according to this model, just going to wiggle around here till Saturday and diminish into a tropical depression, which is still leading for a landfall here somewhere on the panhandle. But if we come take a look at the spaghetti models, it's n it's been... Yesterday, let's just say 24 hours ago, all the spaghetti models took this light blue track, the majority of them. Now they're all taking this vertical track, and the majority now are dog-legging, guess where? Back towards New Orleans, the last place that this baby needs to go. Some of them taking them back to Mexico here in Central America. So very undecided because this is still five days out. The majority of the tracks keep it right here in this line for the next five days. So keep a close eye on it and keep a close eye on the channel as we update you. Now after Ada, we have Theta and Iota. We've been talking about this for weeks and now the mainstream just picked up on it. Could be the next in the busy 2020 hurricane season, the busiest ever manufactured for global warming. And this would be Theta, which is gonna be moving off here towards Europe in North Africa. And there's also another system here they're monitoring south of Ada. So this will be Theta tomorrow, in my guess. And Iota is simmering in the Caribbean. So we're going to keep a close eye there. Las Vegas suffers its coldest November 8th in recorded history. Now that's a long time. That's forever. <laughs> Breaking the 1946 benchmark. Let's talk about Vegas real quick. The Las Vegas Valley set a new all-time daily cold record on Sunday, November 8th, just days after registering a record high, a flip-flopping scenario that Diamond predicted four years ago when he began this channel. He said that as we enter the grand solar minimum, the jet streams will break down, meridional flow will be key, and you're going to see record highs and colds, seasons out of whack. It will be extremely unpredictable, and that's what we're just seeing right here.
The National Weather Services in Las Vegas logged the maximum temperature of just 54 degrees on Sunday, a reading of one Fahrenheit lower than the previous cold back in 1946, which is tonight's first boom. More booms coming. 100-year-old cold record smashed in Reno, Nevada. An Arctic chill descended as far south as Nevada over the weekend thanks to the meridional flow, delivering a record-breaking snowstorm Saturday night into Sunday. Now, we're talking about 100-year-old cold records, but there's also record snow. The valley saw up to 6 inches. Carson City got around 3.5 inches, while Mount Rose Ski received 8 inches. And let's talk about the records after we look at some of the snow shots. Take a look. That is some deep pow-pow. Yes, the beginning of November. A total of 4.5 inches of snow fell at the Reno airport this weekend. With 3.8 inches of that accumulating on Sunday alone. This number comfortably eclipsed the old record for Sunday, set exactly 100 years ago in 1920 by 1.3 inches. That is a destruction of a record, and that is a sign of the times. Now let's talk about the record cold, shall we? The city's airport struggled to get to a high of 34 degrees on Sunday. The coldest Reno has ever been on this date, ever, busting the old record of 38 by 4 fucking degrees. That is a lot. That is epic. This was also set exactly 100 years ago back in 1920. Isn't that funny? As reported by KTVN.com, they're fluxed in Nevada and many other regions. Blizzard pelts north central Montana. We've been calling them for this for four days, and the mainstream does, does not report on it. The only news you can get is up here from KRTV Great Falls, Montana. But the, the uh, forecast that we gave is the forecast they got. So take it for what it's worth. Blizzard pelts north central Montana. Some schools are closed. A blizzard moving through north central Montana this weekend causing dangerous road conditions, widespread power outages, and school closures. The Montana Department of Transportation and the National Weather Service are discouraging people from traveling unless it's absolutely necessary. That sounds like the CDC, <laughs> to be quite honest. Multiple storms for the west this week. Here's the summary and not the bummery. Take a look at the totals to the right as we read down the list. Snow fell throughout the western U.S. over the weekend, and the storm train is lining up to bring more snow this week. System after system after system is in the models. The next storm will favor the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Rockies on Tuesday and Wednesday, while a stronger storm will bring heavy snow to much of the west on Friday and Saturday. The Mountain Collective. The flakes are falling. The season is almost here. Short-term forecast. Yes, here we are. This is 15 miles to the east right here. Look at the snow on the picnic tables, which you're not allowed to sit on because of CDC guidelines. Over the weekend, heavy snow fell across many areas of the western U.S. Wolf Creek in my neck of the woods. Pagosa Springs, southwestern Colorado, picked up 27 inches, 28 inches being predicted just moments ago. So 28 total in the two-day. While Utah saw the first big storm of the season with 27 reported in Alta and 20 in Solitude. Western Montana also received heavy snow and Tahoe saw its first good storm of the season. A season of pleasing. Can you say La Nina? I just did. Here is the snowfall amounts coming from the snowfall analyzer. <laughs> That's just for, for good laughs. It's the snowfall analysis from the last 48 hours. And you can see hours of powers in Montana. Now, this just doesn't end here on the border. Unfortunately, it does on the data set. But this snow actually goes up into Canada. Why we don't share data? Well, it's all about the Benjamins. Follow the money. Now, Montana is mostly buried under 8 inches of snow for the entire state. But 25% of the state is under 12 inches, and the high mountain regions hit 18. A huge boomer of 36 inches here down in the southwestern portion. And the big winner in Colorado is Wolf Creek at 24 inches here in our region, which is actually at 28 inches over the 48-hour period. But you can see here a glorious strip of the global warming goodness throughout the Sierras. We're talking 8 to 16 inches. Yes, 24 up here in the north near Sacramento in the mountains. 
and that's going to help end uh, the fire danger there. Now, we did pick up a little bit of snow in Oregon, and we're talking four to eight inches in the mountains, but the snow in Washington and Oregon over the next two weeks is going to tilt the scale and be record-breaking. Mark my words, Ada impacting South Florida and the Keys. Storm system continues to impact the West and expands to the Central Plains. It's insane. Ada is bringing heavy rain, flooding, thunderstorms, and other... Yeah, strong winds and storm surge to Florida. Hello, there I am. I forgot I even had a camera, which is more like a shmamra. Is that even a word? Where were we? Ada's bringing heavy rain, flooding, thunderstorms, strong winds, and storm surge to Florida. As the western storm system advances east, heavy snow will continue in Montana and the Four Corners region. That's where we are. <laughs> And an elevated fire weather risk persists across the Southern Plains. Additionally, heavy rain and severe thunderstorms are expected in the upper Mississippi Valley into the Central Plains. Now, this fire weather risk in the, in the Midwest here is going to end rapidly as snow overtakes the region. And let's check the GFS. So we do have an excellent wetness coming to Nebraska, Iowa, and Minnesota, as well as parts of Wisconsin, in just the next 24 hours, 36 tops. So here is your Tuesday morning. Snow still falling in Colorado, especially in the northwestern tier, as snow moves into Washington State, burying the Olympics in up to several feet of snow as it moves in. Here is your Tuesday afternoon, noontime. Much of Nebraska is going to be hit with some light snow as the eastern portion of this blizzard lights up. Heavy snow up to 16 inches could be falling in eastern Nebraska and west northwestern Iowa by the end of Tuesday. Wednesday morning, it moves up into Minnesota and parts of Wisconsin on the western tier, and you can see the snow swath here. As heavy snow moves into Idaho and continues to pummel the west, another system moves into the Sierras, bringing heavy snow through the weekend. This is the entire weekend package for Washington. Could be four to eight feet in many regions. Very dangerous conditions. Avalanche warnings and watches will be in effect. We won't go much further, but we'll give you a tippy touch of what it looks like. And it looks like, look at these white areas here in BC coming down into Washington, down into Oregon, 94 inches in Southern Oregon in the mountains through November. That's where do we hit the total, right? Boom, November 24th. That's just the next 15 days, guys. Two weeks are showing four to six feet of snow in the Sierras, up to 10 feet of snow in the Northern Olympics, and all the way up through BC, record-breaking snow totals, tilting the earth. And then a secondary high total here. Take a look at these totals in Idaho. Could be the most dangerous avalanche season ever reported in human history. Those are the facts based on the models. What to know about the earthquake that hit Massachusetts on Sunday? Well, it was a fun day. When I saw it hit, I wanted to make a video but I just had too many other important things to do. And it was only a 4.0 mag, but downgraded to 3.6. The earthquakes was in Buzzards Bay, off the coast of New Bedford, according to the USGS. And people felt it all over New England, according to this woman, which we won't show you because she's not a geologist. She's just reporting on something that someone else wrote. And we're gonna start to disregard those ass tarts for a while now, because we know how they operate on an agenda. I, don't, I have no agenda. My only agenda is for you to watch my show, listen to my scientific analysis, and kiss my... <whistles> now, a 3.6 magnitude earthquake hit southern New England on Sunday, causing little serious damage, but rattling plenty of people's nerves, especially because they have a mask mandate, and the coronavirus is going to kill everyone, and everyone's business is failing, and no one has any money. <laughs> it's that funny. Fear is a liar, by the way. Seismic update. Now we have a mine collapse. Yes, nor 10 kilometers north-northwest of Richlands, Virginia, which could be an effect of that minor earthquake that rumbled up in New England. Now, I know this is maybe five, six, seven hundred 700 miles away. But hey, hey, it's all connected by the North American plate, which is our fate. So there's that. News and updates from Michael Volcano, which might be Mikhail or however you want to pronounce it. But this is a United Kingdom. This is in the UK, South Sandwich Islands. A thermal anomaly in the summit crater continues. And take a look. Let me just open this image because it's still going to be tiny over here. Oh, 
But look at the little glow dot. That is not Burning Man or a rave in the South Sandwich Islands. That is lava sitting at the bottom of that caldera, which means, yeah, there's lava down there. Isn't that amazing how that works? Just like that. A satellite image from 6 November shows that continuous elevated surface temperatures in the summit crater were identified. On the 24th October, a gas steam plume was observed in the satellite images. This could be a result of low-level Stromboli activity, which, by the way, makes me hungry because I love mozzarella and pepperoni rolled up like a pizza. It is delicious. Now, previous news, Michael Volcano had a volcanic advisory back in 7th April 2019, but that's the last report. And now we see a little glowing ember here on the South Sandwich Islands. Now, the current status is two out of five. As soon as this gets up to three, which might be in the coming days or weeks, we could see boom time. Now, eruptive style, 1819, 1823, 1995, 2001, 6, 15. So this baby has been coming very active very recently. So this will be a grand solar minimum eruptor. If you're in the way of this volcano, take heed and be prepared because it is warming up. Just like Al Gore. Why are, shut up Al, get in your hole. I mean, he's, now I built the house, he's still, I mean, he, he got bunt caked. Why the Arctic sea ice is stalled? Well, because the media is not a scientist, a propagandist, and reports on whatever they're told to report on, not facts. We're about to blow you out of the water right here on this sh article of nonsense. Now, this has been perpetrated for three decades. The Arctic ice has been melting. We're all going to burn up. It's going to be ice-free in 2010 and 2015. The Arctic is going to be ice-free in 2020. Now it's 2025. Some people say 2030. Now it's going to be ice-free in 2035. Do you see a pattern here? In the next few decades, according to this article, scientists expect we'll see an ice-free Arctic. Now they're at 2040. <laughs> That prospect got much closer in 2020, due in part to an exceptional summer heat wave that roiled the Russian Arctic. Yes, they're claiming that sea ice is at an all-time low and we're all dead. There are two problems with that. The first one is that we have accurate data from the Danish Meteorological Institute showing the entire Arctic covered from coast to coast with sea ice. One, two, three, four, six and a half months before maximum ice. So we still have six and a half months for ice to build and the entire Arctic is covered. Some areas covered with, yes, red. That would be 4.5 meters of ice or more. If you don't know how thick that is, that's two-story house thick across the entire Arctic. It's a lot of ice. There's no passage in the Northwest and there's limited icebreaker passage along Siberia. And we're six months away from maximum ice. Now, here's a few things you should know. I haven't repeated this every day for the last four years, but there are two ways to determine ice. Ice extent and ice volume and thickness. We use volume and thickness from the DMI for a reason. Because volume and thickness cannot be perpetrated. When you're talking a two-dimensional extent, that can be forced geologically by wind, where you can spread thin ice over a long area and not be showing a lot of ice. The entire Arctic could have ice extent over the whole Arctic, one inch thick, and global warmest will say, oh my God, we're all frozen. It's over. But the fact is that we could all be burning up at that point because it's the ice volume that matters. The amount of ice that forms every year, how much is forming, how deep does it go into the ocean that we can't see? If there are prevailing winds pushing all winter in one direction, let's say from Siberia towards Canada, you're going to get a small ice sheet that's just built up over Canada that's extremely thick. It's called weather. They don't explain that to you because they're frauds and they have a narrative and they have a mission, which is to feed you propaganda, keep you scared that it's your fault that the earth is warming. And the fact is, is that there's only natural climate variability, barely any warming over the last 150 years. And in fact, over the last three and a half years, we've been cooling. 
and ICE has been building. More importantly, more data coming out to prove what we've been saying all along. The differences between the ice sat and the cryosat 2 sea ice thickness over the Arctic, well, here's the problem. The U.S. model that has been claiming that we're burning up and we're in record low territory is incorrect. When they put up the second satellite, it showed an anomaly. Yes, it showed that one, the initial source of the cryosat data, ice sat, was incorrect. In fact, by 50 Mill 50 centimeters. It was incorrectly measuring the thickness 50 centimeters thicker. And when you're only talking about 100 centimeters on average, that's half as thick. So the mainstream using their own scientific analysis was giving you bogus data that was 50 percent less than reality. So the last 10 years of Arctic ice data is shite based on this paper over here. I don't make it up, I just report the data. And the powers that be that got the funding from the National Science Foundation and other corporations to prove that we're burning up, we're using a satellite that proved that the ice was thinner because the data was flawed by 50%. In fact, the ice over the last decade was twice as thick or 50 centimeters thicker than the data set showed. Do you think that they'll update that data? Crickets, yeah, nothing but Mary Greeley. Now, on the size of the flare associated with the solar proton event of 774 AD, this is the Charlemagne event. I've done petroglyph, vi petroglyph videos in central Utah on the topic where we were at a region looking at a plasma discharge glyph. We read the moniker sign, the placard right to the right, and it said that these Indians w had recorded this around 700 AD. My mind exploded because that same week the first paper on the Charlemagne event actually came out corroborating that the ancients saw a plasma discharge in the sky unlike anything we've ever seen in modern times. And they recorded on the rock. And it's my supposition that a large percentage of the southwestern petroglyphs that can be considered modern Puebloan or Anasazi are actually natives witnessing the Charlemagne event in 774 AD. This would include Squatter Man, Jacob's Ladder, and other anomalies in the sky that would be so fantastical that you would have to record it on rock. Now, the 774 AD solar proton event detected in cosmogenic nucleotides similar to the Carrington event or any recent large solar outburst, the one in 89 that took the grid out in Quebec and many others, here is an analysis on the intensity and size of it. Now, the initial numbers came out that this was an X-285 flare. If that would happen Earth-facing today, we would be in the Stone Age and within five months would be eating your neighbor. And that's what we're waiting for. We're not waiting for an X-285. But they consider this a dual event where there were two puffs, boom, boom, puff, puff, pass. And those two events, they're now saying, the inferred flare size drops to X180 in that sense. But X, an X180, look, an X18 will take out the grid, earth-facing. An X180, anyone's guess whose hair falls out and how many people die of myocardial infarction, how many people go completely insane and stab everybody in the walls or eat their children. It's like bath salts from space. That's what these X flares are. So, sign of the times is what we have to look forward to. Long-term observations of galactic cosmic rays. New paper coming out, 4th of November, 2020. I only share new papers, by the way. Now, this article has been accepted for publication undergone full peer review. The Cosmic Ray Telescope for the Effects of Radiation Crater has been orbiting the moon since 2009, and the data coming back shows what we've been screaming for years. Well, except smash -o -mash. He still thinks that we're wrong. There's that. So according to this paper, which we're just reporting on, it's not our data, it's not our analysis. So I just sent him this paper, and he went off on me as if I had written it. No context, I didn't even make a comment. And this is the problem with society today. Everyone has preconceived notions and is making up sh in their head. 
They have a narrative going on up there. They don't meditate. They don't stretch. There's no spirituality. They're not connected to source. Mostly just assholes looking for a fight. I haven't gotten in a fight since I was in high school, by the way, physically. Well, there was that one thing with the gangbanger back in two. Well, anyway, but energetic particle radiation consists of fast-moving atomic particles, and we're concerned about the galactic cosmic rays. Also, SCRs, solar cosmic rays, are just as deadly, but they only come out during outbursts. The GCRs are constantly raining down through your body and through the Earth all the time, and we're at the galactic cosmic ray maximum, the highest it's ever been since back at the end of the last solar minimum back in 2009 and 10. And according to this paper, here are the key points. The intensity of galactic cosmic rays as of early 2020 has recovered and is now slightly exceeding the historical levels of 2009. Now, the takeaway there is that in 2009, we reached the galactic cosmic ray maximum. Proven. And according to this paper, the intensity of GCRs as of early 2020 has recovered and is slightly exceeding historical high levels of the last historical high. So, you make your own conclusion. You're living the galactic cosmic ray maximum, which means acute myocardial infarction, increased mental perturbations for people that have cognitive diminution. That means if you're a mental patient, you might go crazy. We call it the full moon effect. But more importantly, it's your elderly loved ones that may exert themselves during times of KP0, where galactic cosmic rays are high. This could trigger the event, which causes the, the, the stroke. So knowing space weather as it's happening, maybe you can warn the elderly, like, hey, grandma, maybe you want to stay calm this weekend. We got some things that might <whistles> you off the grid. Now, on a side note, very bad news coming in from the tribe. I don't know if Ransom wants me to share this, but I think it's important for the community to understand why 420 Freedomist might be off the air for a day or so. The most important person in his life, in his family, his grandmother, who lived right down the road, had a stroke while he was here helping us at the ranch. He had to leave suddenly. He's not going to be on the trip. We are praying for him. We gave him our support. We're helping him out. And, and we want you all to send your love and prayers over to our good friend Ransom at 420 Freedomist Films who's dealing with a very difficult situation right now. So, all of you in the tribe, send Ransom some love or some good juju his way because he's in a difficult situation. Thank you. <coughs> now, a fireball streaks across the sky in New Jersey and neighboring states and people are losing their <whistles> But it's just a little bolide. If you don't know what a bolide is, please Google it. Or use DuckDuckGo if you don't want to be monitored. So you can see clearly here an excellent uh, example of a bolide. Not a particularly spectacular one. It's just a, just a regular object that's entering up and burning up as before it hits the surface. So there's the bolide in question. Which actually, if you want to take a... Let me just get some of this out of there. If you want to take a close-up by here... You can actually see it's, it breaks apart here into several sections. Watch it right there, break into two. Okay, so that's nice scientific analysis. So heads up on the bolide. I don't know where this video came from. It came from American Meteor Society. No one subscribes there. They barely have any views. So subscribe there. Give them a thumbs up. Please, let's blow this up. Say Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project sent me over here. And maybe they'll appreciate us because very few people do. Trust me, we have a long way to go. We're 30 minutes in, but let's wrap this up quickly. People who regularly eat chili peppers live longer. Now, I know this from extensive research into holistic healing and natural medicines that simply a small dose, a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper every day is proven to keep you alive 10 to 15 years longer. And this is probably related to the same study. So you need that ingredient in red cayenne pepper. I recommend red cayenne pepper. It's so cheap. You get it at the dollar store. But if you can buy the organic for 3 or $4, get that. And just do a quarter teaspoon a day or use that amount in your food. And people who regularly eat this chili pepper live longer. And all the papers are in the article. 
So please read it. We'll just give you a quick synopsis. Large scale study finds correlation between the consumption of spicy capsaicins and capsicums are what's in that red pepper flakes or the powder. The cayenne powder is the best because it's packed into that dust and you just need a little bit. Boom. And significant reductions in disease mortality are associated with an uptick in spicy capsicums, which is red pepper, red pepper flakes, which is why all the Asians live long. That's in their, all of their meal. And at, you can just do the research. Do your homework. Now, a new study reveals the best way to cook rice to remove arsenic. We're in a prepper community, and all you people in rice, beans, and bullets need to learn some skills. A lot of you are fat and lazy and complacent, don't know how to fish or hunt. You just watch TV. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. But I'm just, I'm chiding you. Not all preppers are fat and lazy, but some of them are. You know, some politicians are fat and lazy. Look at Chris Christie. The fattest, most unhealthy human on earth who got COVID-19 lived. That alone should wake you up to the scandemic. But I digress. New study reveals the best way to cook rice to remove arsenic. Now, if you have prepped, Bean, dried beans and white rice, good on you. But if you don't want to die because you eat white rice for three straight years and you die of arsenic poisoning, listen up. There is a new methodology because they did a scientific study on how to cook white rice to remove 90% of the arsenic. Well, 50% at least. But it's simple parboiling. And I'm going to run it through, but I'm going to show you the paper. Improve rice cooking approach to maximize arsenic removal while preserving nutrient elements. So, it's so simple, I'm going to break it down in layman's terms, and you're just going to want to listen to what I have to say because you'll never forget what I have to say right now. First, take the right amount of water to rice you want to boil. So if you want to boil, you want to cook a, a cup of rice, you need two cups of water boiling. If you're in the mountainous region above six, 7,000 feet, you need two and a half cups of water. So based on your local position, Boil the correct amount of water for the rice that you've chosen and get that boiling. Once it's boiling, you take your dry rice and you dump it in the boiling water and you set the timer. In five minutes, you pull it off the burner in the rolling boil and you drain it immediately. It's parboiled. It hasn't really penetrated the kernel, but what it's done is it's released over 60% of the arsenic, 54 to 73% anyway. So that's a great number. And then you put the rice back in, add the right two cups of water, and then finish the boil. That's how you do it. And it's a new technique to help save your when it hits the fan. More information coming now. And a little side note here. I've been trying to get Patrick Moore on the show, but he wants money. So we're not paying. We don't pay anybody. We don't have a budget. We, I barely can pay my phone bill. <laughs> So we're not paying Patrick Moore to come on the show because he's not that important. Not only that, no one will watch because he's literally a global warming alarmist from back in the day that most people don't know is on our side now. But only halfway. This prick supports GMOs, but that's a whole side podcast we won't even get into. But what he is doing is writing a new book and he's crowdsourcing it. He's not crowdfunding it in a way that you get the book. He's just doing... Um, he just wants your money. <laughs> it's a GoFundMe. Give me your money so I can make the book. You don't get the book. And there are some suckers here that are giving like a thousand bucks. I don't even get it. But anyway, it's going to be a good book. And if you could just buck up five or ten bucks to help him publish it, that would help. You're not going to get the book, which is why he's a crook. But And most people like me, if I ever published a book, I would do a crowdfunding where if you gave me ten bucks, you'd get the book for free, for, for fuck's sake. But this guy is, is, is still a prick. Even though he's gone from global warming to not global warming, still a prick because he supports GMOs and other dumb shit that are completely nonsensical. So the guy's obviously a, still a 50% shill paid off because he has a family and no money. And once you unfriend Greenpeace, you're basically a target. But he has published some good shit. Now, Fake Invisible Catastrophes and Threats of Doom is his new book he's trying to fund. And sounds like a good read because it's all true. Now, if you're actually trying to survive and thrive in the future and you want to know some 
excellent free re resources. I've shared this over the last three years several times, and it comes from the University of Minnesota Extension. I used their initial greenhouse plans extensively in my research on how I was going to create the most efficient and effective solar greenhouse for my region. And what they've developed is the deep winter greenhouse plans, which I think are 80% good, but wholeheartedly not good. Now, clearly this model here that they've created works and is useful in Minnesota where they're from. But there are way more efficient ways to get warmer air into your greenhouse than this model. I'm not selling it out. I'm saying it's completely effective and workable. They have proven studies over the last decade on how nonprofits have raised money in these greenhouses, how farms have increased their bottom dollar in these greenhouses, and on and on. The most important thing is if you build a deep winter greenhouse, you may be able to survive and thrive in the winter in cold environments or in times of grid down, no food in the supermarkets and no electricity. So if you're thinking of preparedness and how to survive and thrive in the future, a deep winter greenhouse in zones 5B and, a, and lower are mandatory. Even 6A, mandatory. If you want to grow in January and you're in 6A, you need a deep winter greenhouse. But I recommend earth tubes over climate battery. But that's a different discussion. So we're going to leave you links to this. We'll leave you links to the extension at University of Minnesota EDU. If you want to get the plans for their newest deep green winter greenhouse, which was just released 12 hours ago, click here. Deep winter greenhouse 2.2 construction documents. You'll have to provide them with your name and your email address for updates, but they don't sell it. This is a university. Click on it and get the download. We did. And it is fantastic. Okay, let's move this down here. Here is a picture of the Deep Winter Greenhouse 2.2. And the entire 30-page PDF, it tells you everything you need, everything about the construction and specs, completely spec'd out for your code and your county. And if you have no skills and tons of money and you just want to get a contractor, well, boom, he's got it all laid out here for him. There's no questions. There's no problems. This is proven technology that has grown thousands of tons of food for hundreds of farmers in the coldest environments in the United States. Same as our greenhouse, it consists of a subsurface insulated, super thick R50 wall, which contains the climate battery, the upper region, which is well insulated, a south facing glazed angled 50 degree wall. And the result is food production in the middle of winter in the coldest environments in the US. The deep winter greenhouse version 2.2 is available free for you at the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, link below. Hope you got something out of the video. Times are changing, and we're trying to prepare you, not scare you. Proper prior planning prevents piss-poor performance. As the election is rigged, mask mandates will soon be a thing of the future. Mandatory vaccinations, civil war, global unrest. It's all happening, and you need to be prepared because within one or two years, we're looking at an X-115 smacking the grid and bringing us back to the Stone Age. Will your deep winter greenhouse be built? Will you have enough prep material, rice and beans and microgreens and seeds? Do you even know what I'm talking about? I hope so. We love each and every one of you. Thank you to our one-time donors, our Patreons, and every single person that shared this video on social media. We're blocked and banned still for another day and a half. I can't do a thing, which is why viewership is down, because I can't do what I do. They're suppressing us for a reason. They do not want you to be prepared because when they click that switch, we will be the resistance and they do not want us to be too large because we'll be too large and in charge to take out because I got the clout. Be safe. We love you. Wednesday morning, Butler Canyon Archaeological yes, area.